street fights, murders, inquests, riots, a whiskey mill every 15 steps, a board of aldermen, a mayor, a city surveyor, a city engineer, a chief of the fire department with first, second, and third assistants, a chief of police, city marshal, and a large police force, two boards of mining brokers, a dozen breweries and half a dozen jails and station houses in full operation, and some talk of building a church. The flush times were in magnificent flower. Large fireproof brick buildings were going up in the principal streets, and the wooden suburbs were spreading out in all directions. Town lots soared up to prices that were amazing. The great Comstock load stretched its opulent length straight through the town from north to south, and every mine on it was in diligent process of development. One of these mines alone employed 675 men, and in the matter of elections, the adage was, as the gold and curry goes, so goes the city. Laboring men's wages were four and six dollars a day, and they worked in, their, in three shifts or gangs, and the blasting and picking and shoveling went on without ceasing night and day. The city, quote, of Virginia roosted royally midway up the steep side of Mount Davidson, 7,200 feet above the level of the sea and in the clear Nevada atmosphere was visible from a distance of 50 miles. It claimed a population of 15,000 to 18,000, and all day long half of this little army swarmed the streets like bees, and the other half swarmed among the drifts and tunnels of the, com uh, of the Comstock, hundreds of feet down in the earth directly under those same streets. Often we felt our chairs jar and heard the faint boom of a blast down in the bowels of the earth under the office. The mountainside was so steep that the entire town had a slant to it like a roof. Each street was a terrace, and from each to the next street below the descent was 40 or 50 feet. The fronts of the houses were level with the street they faced, but their rear first floors were propped on lofty stilts. A man could stand at a rear first floor window of a C Street house and look down the chimneys of the row of houses below him facing D Street. It was a laborious climb in that thin atmosphere to ascend from D to A Street and you were panting and out of breath when you got there. But you could turn around and go down again like a house afire, so to speak. The atmosphere was so rarefied on account of the great altitude that one's blood lay near the surface always and the scratch of a pin was a disaster worth worrying about. For the chances were that a grievous erysophilus would ensue. But to offset this, the thin atmosphere seemed to carry healing to gunshot wounds, and therefore to simply shoot your adversary, th adversary through both lungs was a thing not likely to afford you any permanent satisfaction, for he would be nearly certain to be around looking for you within the month, and not with an opera glass either. From Virginia's airy situation, one could look over a vast, far-reaching panorama of mountain ranges and deserts, and whether the day was bright or overcast, whether, whether the sun was rising or setting, or flaming in the zenith, or whether night and the moon held sway, the spectacle was always impressive and beautiful. Over your head Mount Davidson lifted its gray dome, and before and below you a rugged canyon clothed the battlemented hills, making a somber gateway through which a soft-tinted desert was glimpsed, with the silver thread of a river winding through it, bordered with trees which 
many miles of distance diminished to a delicate fringe. And still further away the snowy mountains rose up and stretched their long barrier to the filmy horizon, far enough beyond a lake that burned in the desert like a fallen sun, though that itself lay fifty miles removed. Look from your window where you would. There was fascination in the picture. At rare intervals, but very rare, there were clouds in our skies. And then the setting sun would glide and flush and glorify this magnificent expanse of scenery with a bewildering pomp of color that held the eye like a spell and moved the spirit like music. Chapter 44, Flush Times, Plenty of Stock, Editorial Puffing, Stocks Given Me, Salting Minds, A Tragedian in a New Role. My salary was increased to $40 a week, but I seldom drew it. I had plenty of other resources, and what were two, and what were two broad twenty-dollar gold pieces to a man who had his pockets full of such, and a cumbersome abundance of bright half dollars besides. Paper money has never come into use on the Pacific Coast. Reporting was lucrative, and every man in the town was lavish with his money and his feet. The city and all the great mountainside were riddled with mining shafts. There were more mines than miners. True, not ten of these mines were yielding rock worth hauling to a mill, but everybody said, wait till the shaft gets down where the ledge comes in solid, and then you will see. So nobody was discouraged. These were nearly all wildcat mines, and wholly worthless. But nobody believed it then. The Ophir and Golden Curry and Mexican and other great names on the Comstock lead in Virginia and Gold Hill were turning out huge piles of rich rock every day. And every man believed that his little wildcat claim was as good as any of the main lead and would infallibly be worth a thousand dollars a foot when he got down where it came in solid. Poor fellow, he was blessedly blind to the fact that he never would see that day. So the thousand wildcat shafts burrowed deeper and deeper into the earth day by day and all men were beside themselves with hope and happiness. How they labored, prophesied, exalted. Surely nothing like it was ever seen before since the world began. Every one of these wildcat mines, not mines, but holes in the ground over imaginary mines, were incorporate, was incorporated and had handsomely engraved stock. And the stock was saleable, too. It was bought and sold with a feverish avid, avidity in the boards every day. You could go up to the mountain on the mountainside, scratch around and find a ledge. There was no lack of them. Put up a notice with a grandiloquent name in it. Start a shaft, get your stock printed. And with nothing whatever to prove that your mine was worth a straw, you could put your stock on the market and sell out for hundreds and even thousands of dollars. To make money and make it fast was as easy as it was to eat your dinner. Every man owned feet in fifty different wildcat mines and considered his fortune made. Think of a city with not one solitary poor man in it. One would suppose that when month after month went by and still not a wildcat mine, by wildcat I mean in general terms, any claim not located on the mother vein, i.e. the Comstock, yielded a ton of rock worth crushing, the people would begin to wonder if they were not putting too much faith in their prospective riches. But there was not a thought of such a thing. They burrowed away 
bought and sold and were happy. New claims were taken up daily, and it was the friendly custom to run straight to the newspaper offices, give the reporter 40 or 50 feet, and get them to go and examine the mine and publish a notice of it. They did not care a fig what you said about the property, so you said something. Consequently, we generally said a word or two to the effect that the indications were good or that the ledge was six feet wide or that the rock resembled the calm stuff, and so it did. But as a general thing, the resemblance was not startling enough to knock you down. If the rock was moderately promising, we followed the custom of the count of the country, used strong adjectives and frothed at the mouth as if a very marvel in silver discoveries had transpired. If the mine was a developed one and had no pay or to show, and of course it hadn't, we praised the tunnel, said it was one of the most infatuating tunnels in the land, driveled and draveled about the tunnel till we ran entirely out of ecstasies, but never said a word about the rock. We would squander half a column of adulation on a shaft or a new wire rope or a dressed pine windlass, or a fascinating force pump, and close with a burst of admiration of the gentlemanly and, ef and efficient superintendent of the mine, but never utter a whisper about the rock. And those people were always pleased, always satisfied. Occasionally we patched up and varnished our reputation for discrimination and stern, undeviating accuracy by giving some old abandoned claim a blast that ought to have made its dry bones rattle. And then somebody would seize it and sell it on the fleeting notoriety thus conferred upon it. There was nothing in the shape of a mining claim that was not saleable. We received presents of feet every day if we needed a hundred dollars or so, we sold some. If not, we hoarded it away, satisfied that it would ultimately be worth a thousand dollars a foot. I had a trunk about half full of stock. When a claim made a stir in the market and went up to a high figure, I searched through my pile to see if I had any of its stock, and generally found it. The prices rose and fell constantly. But still, a fall dis disturbed us little, because a thousand dollars a foot was our figure, and so we were content to let it fluctuate as much as it pleased till it reached it. My pile of stock was not all given to me by people who wished their claims noticed. At least half of it was given me by persons who had no thought of such a thing, and looked for nothing more than a simple verbal thank you. And you were not even obliged to, by law to furnish that. If you are coming up the street with a couple of baskets of apples in your hands and you meet a friend, you naturally invite him to take a few. That describes the condition of things in Virginia in the flush times. Every man had his pockets full of stock, and it was the actual custom of the country to part with small quantities of it to friends without the asking. Very often, it was a good idea to close the transaction instantly when a man offered a stock present to a friend, for the offer was only good and binding at that moment, and if the price went to a high figure shortly afterward, the procrastination was a thing to be re regretted. Mr. Stewart, senator now from Nevada, one day told me he would give me 20 feet of justice stock if I would walk over to his office. It was worth 5 or $10 a foot. I asked him to make the offer good for next day, as I was just going to dinner. He said he would not be in town, so I rushed it and, so I risked it and took my dinner instead of the stock. Within the week, the price went up to $70 and afterward to 150 but nothing could make the man yield. I suppose he sold that stock of mine 
and placed the guilty proceeds in his own pocket. My revenge will be found in the accompanying portrait. 